I, mean, I pray God will speak to your heart today as if me and you are sitting in a room. God's calling and purpose for your life is a detailed call. It's a detailed call. It's not random. It, it, we all, I'm just telling you, here's a working definition. They're going to put it on the screen here. Maybe you want to take your phone, take a picture of it. But I want you to receive this into your spirit. God's calling is God's invitation for me to live his plan for my life. God's calling is God's invitation for me to live his plan for my life. He's not here to serve your plan. He's not here to make you comfortable. He's here to, to fulfill his plan on the earth. It's personal and it's unique to each and every one of us. Romans 8.28 says this, and we read this in different translations last weekend, and I pray that you can grab this into your heart. This is not just a verse for when we have trouble in our lives. So often we use this as a verse to try to justify what happened. And I'm telling you, this is God's word for us that we could grab this, embrace this, and realize God wants each and every one of us to step into this. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good. And then he finishes it. Because sometimes we say, well, you know, all this bad stuff that might happen in my life, and that's just, you know, it all works for the good. Well, it does, but it says this, to those who love God. To those that love God, who are called according to his purpose. And when you and I accept that calling, when we accept that responsibility, we realize that everything that has been going on in our life is directly linked to his purpose. God only calls us things to work for our good when we love him and we respond to his calling. And for so many people in church, in Christianity, we love God, but we're not responding to his calling. We're not responding to what God has laid out for our lives. If you're not responding to God's calling, your life will get harder and harder. You're going to find everything thrown in your path and everything hindering you and the enemy just attacking you and, and, and trying to steal your worth and your value. But when you realize and you step into your calling, the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. It's not conditional on circumstances. It's not conditional upon everything working out. It's like, no, no, no. I'm going to fulfill my calling no matter what comes into my life. I'm going to stay in that place of God's love and favor and blessing. And the hand of God will guide you into a, a path of brighter and brighter. Life gets hard when you start living and acting like everybody else. When you start letting every circumstance and every situation cause you to respond to life the way others respond to life. We're not called to respond the way others respond. We are called to walk in the spirit, to walk in the faith of Christ so that no matter what happens, it doesn't change our demeanor. It doesn't cause us to respond in our flesh. It doesn't cause us to react like others react. When you're acting like everyone else and thinking like everyone else, you're going to have what everyone else has. We're called to be a peculiar people. Not weird. Some of you are making excuses because you just act weird. And it's like, no, no, no. We're not called to be weirdos. We're called to be peculiar. You know what I'm saying? And when you understand God's purposes in your life, when you understand God's plan in your life, you're going you're gonna to realize 1 Peter 2, 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of, he called you, he called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So when things happen, when situations come, when drama shows up, you don't respond the way the world does. You respond the way Jesus would respond. The power of God will make you a witness and change your life. I wonder if there's enough evidence in your life that you're a Christian. I wonder if you're displaying enough evidence, if you are a witness to the power of a changing God that comes into our lives and changes our lives. 
The power should make us look like him in our daily lives. It should cause us to do what he did. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 5, and I'll read it in the New King James for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. And in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sakes. He's telling us about this power. He said the word, the gospel comes with power. It's the word dunamis. Dunamis. And the definition is strength, ability, inerrant power. Power residing in a thing by its virtue and its nature. There's a transformation that happens in the life of a believer as we step into our calling. This dunamis, it's where we get the English word dynamite. Inside of every believer should be the explosive power to overcome every situation and every circumstance. That's what God has in store for you and I as we step into his calling for our lives. People, people who don't live with dunamis power, people who, re, who aren't living with that Holy Spirit power inside of them, wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. It's the list, it's all the chores, it's all these things. But those of us who are living with the power of the Holy Spirit, those that are living with dynamite in us, we wake up and say, good morning, Lord. Good morning, world. I'm about to advance the kingdom of God today. 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith, with us by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine dunamis, his divine power has given all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's speaking this word to us. He's saying this is how we're to live our daily lives. This is how you're to function in every circumstance, in every challenge that comes your way. You're to operate in the dunamis power of God. Acts 1 and verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said, you have heard from me, and for John truly baptized with water, but you shall receive, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. We need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, church. Every one of you in this room, let me speak to your heart and tell you, you need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not goosebumps, not a moment in the service, but a daily impact of God's word in your life that causes you to rise up and say, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Getting baptized in the Holy Spirit changes everything. And when we get a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, it enables us to step into his calling. I taught us years ago uh, what, what, it, what it looks like and, and how to make a pickle. Anybody remember how to make a pickle? Probably don't. Probably some of you probably weren't even here when I talked about it. But to make a pickle, you have to find a pickle bush. A pickle vine. Have anybody ever seen a pickle vine? No. No, 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 that's weird. There are no pickle vines. There's only cucumbers. There's cucumbers. Here's the recipe to make a pickle. You take a cucumber, you dip it in boiling water, and you clean off any bacteria. Then you submerge it in the vinegar for 12 hours. You got it. A pickle can never become a cucumber again. This is the process of coming into faith. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you come in and you get dipped in God's love and he cleans you of all the sin bacteria in your life. This is what salvation looks like. We come into this place where God begins to cleanse us. God begins to wash us in his blood. He cleanses us of all the unrighteousness and all that mess that we were involved in. And he takes us and he brings us into salvation. And then, you, then, then what happens is you get submerged in the Holy Spirit dunamis, the Holy Spirit power, and then you're never the same again. It's called transformation. And until you get that, you're never going to fully step into your calling. 
When the Holy Spirit power is released through our lives, we begin to operate in his calling. How many of you would be honest and say, Pastor Greg, I've been serving the God for a while, and I'm just really not sure what my calling is, and it's okay to lift your hand. How many would say, I'm not sure what my calling is? Just lift your hand. A lot. A lot of us. And some of you don't want to lift your hand, but you're always like, what's God's calling? What's God want from me? But I know, I know from, from meeting with people, and, and, and there's a lot of people that don't understand what our calling is. And what your individual calling is. And here's a picture of what calling, for what the calling of Jesus Christ looked like. this This is what our calling looks like. In Jesus was 30 years old. It's in Luke chapter 4. He's 30 years old. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness. He's he's gone into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And he's there for he's there and he's being tempted. And look at verse 13. He's about to announce to the world what his calling is. In Luke 4, verse 13, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until, a more, until an opportune time. Then Jesus returned in the power, the dunamis, the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the news of him went throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Then he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up and he read. And and he was handed the book from the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Here's where God gives us a clear picture of our calling. If you want to know your calling, you want to know what your calling is, this is the perfect picture of calling. Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Here are the six things that Jesus was about. If you study his ministry and you begin to look at those three years of his ministry on the earth, this, is, this sums up. These are the focus points of your calling. These are the focus points of my calling. Here they are. Number one, the Spirit of the Lord is coming upon you. Your calling is to get up every morning and get the Spirit of the Lord upon you. It's to focus in the morning, to pray in the morning, to set apart the first part of your day and call upon the Lord. And so many of us, we're so busy and and life is so consuming, we miss this part. This is how you start every day. You wake up every day, and the first thing out of your mouth should be, good morning, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. I am at your beckoning call. I am here to fulfill the purposes and plans that you have for this day. It's the first part of our calling. The Spirit of the Lord is coming upon you. Number two, you preach the gospel to the poor. This is the second point of everybody, you and me in a room, locked up, nobody's there, I'm looking at you and I'm telling you, this is your calling. Preach the gospel to the poor. What's the gospel? The good news. Preach the good news to the poor. Number three, heal the brokenhearted. This is our calling. This is your calling. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. You preach the gospel to the poor. You heal the brokenhearted. You proclaim liberty to the captives. Number five, the recovery of sight to the blind. You're healing the sick. It's what we heard testimony of this this morning as this gentleman to share with us how God healed that blurriness in his eye and healed him. Number six, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Listen to me. These six things are unique to you, but they're, they're, they're the same for everybody in this room. They're unique to your position. You may be a stay-at-home mom. You may own and operate a business. You may, you may be a doctor, a lawyer, a preacher, a teacher. It doesn't matter who you are. You and I have a calling from God, and it is defined in these six points. Every day of your life, you have to wake up every day and think, I'm going to fulfill calling in my life. These things have to happen in my life daily. Everybody in this room should have a testimony of something that happened this week. 
I laid hands on a sick person. I led somebody to Jesus. I introduced somebody to Jesus Christ. Neil had the opportunity to lead a person to Jesus Christ this week and to bring them into salvation. They had no idea. She, the question was asked, what is salvation? And he began to explain the gospel. This should happen on a daily basis in all of our lives. There ought to be somebody oppressed, somebody discouraged, somebody that's broken, somebody that needs deliverance, somebody that needs a miracle, somebody that needs healed. It ought to be happening every day in this church with every person in here. You're calling is to fulfill the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples you don't have to wonder what it is this is our calling it's unique you don't have to do it the same way you don't have to be like anybody else you don't have to be like me but you have to fulfill your calling we have a team that goes to, to the mall and they preach in the malls and they just watch for people that need prayer and approach them and ask them for prayer. That's their style. You don't have to do it your way, but you have to fulfill your calling. You can't sit at home week after week and do nothing. We are called to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and to fulfill that calling in our lives. Amen. Most people want you to spend your time working on your weaknesses. They want to point out everything you're doing wrong and everything you're not doing right and constantly get you focused on. you got to fix all these things before God can use you. Where does that come from? That's not from the word of the Lord. He calls you and he says, look here, I want you to focus on your strengths. I want you to get the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and that power will conquer your weaknesses. Amen. Amen. Focus on the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. You'll overcome your weaknesses through the dunamis, through the explosive power of God that comes inside of us and gives us the ability to do what we can't do on our own. Some of you are anointed to work in children's ministry. Some of you are anointed givers. You've been called to give, and you're blessing all the time, and that's an amazing thing. Some of you need to realize there's healing in your hands. What Minister Zach said today, everybody with hands has healing in their hands. Everybody with a voice, everybody with eyes, you have compassion in your heart, and you need to look at people with compassion and show them the love of God. God will use you in deliverance. Some of you are called to missions. Some of you are called to to, to be a doctor, a a, a lawyer, a prophet. It doesn't matter what you are. You have to release his calling through your occupation. You, You make his calling a priority in your life. And then no matter who you're meeting with, wherever you go, it's opportunity. I'm looking for opportunity. Everybody that comes into your life, everybody that speaks to you. Every, when we first started this church, if you smiled at me, you was a candidate, baby. I was coming after you. It didn't matter where we were at, man. I would be in McDonald's, and this guy was standing before me, and he turned around. He's big, man. He played for Penn State. He was this big guy. He was a big football guy. He was in front of me. He turned around. He smiled at me. He said, you can go before me. I went, there's a candidate for Jesus, man. He's got the heart of the Lord asking me to go before him. I said, man, hey, where are you from? He said, I I went to Penn State. I just graduated. I'm coaching football at Gulf Coast High School. I said, come on, can I sit with you? He said, yeah. By the time that thing was over, Robert, I'm sitting at a table holding his hand. People thought we were gay. I was like, I'm just holding his hand. I'm like, I'm just telling you, man, God's got a plan for your life. He starts crying. The Spirit of God came upon him. I led him to Jesus Christ. I baptized him in water. Listen, everywhere you go, there are people who are candidates for the Lord Jesus Christ, and you got to start operating in your calling. you got to step out and get bold. It isn't about you. It isn't about your abilities. It isn't about your knowledge. It's about the power of God working through your strengths and causing you to overcome every weakness. Whatever you do, release the power of God. His calling will change your world. you got to see yourself the way that God sees you, operating in his power. Your age doesn't matter. This is, the, this is the trick of the enemy. It makes you feel like you're too old to do all that. That was for when I was younger. Or you're too young and you can't do that until you get more knowledge. I'm just telling you right now, it, it's happening in our children. My wife went over to Lukey, who was sitting over there, and Bobby said, I just wanted Luke to pray for me. I don't know why. She kneeled down. Luke laid her hands on her. And Bobby comes back. She's crying. She said, he just started prophesying over me. Like stuff I didn't even. Lukey, come here. How, how old are you, baby? Eight? How old are you? Huh? No, how old are you, though? Seven. Seven. He's seven years old. 
He laid hands on my wife and started prophesying. Bobby said it wasn't even stuff I was asking her to pray for, but out of his spirit came this word of encouragement and strength. And I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your circumstance. It doesn't matter who you are. If you'll step out in those six things and say, hey, that's what we're called to do. We're going to see the glory of God change a city. We're going to see revival fire that will impact the nation. Come on. Amen. Joshua was 40 years old when God, when Moses sent him out to spy off the land. In Joshua 14, verse 7, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy off the land, and I brought back a word to him as it were in my heart. Esther was just a young teenage girl. We don't know exactly how old she was, but she was just a young teenage girl when she stood before the king and she defended an entire nation. She responded to the call. Jeremiah was just a kid. All through the Bible, in Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. In the womb. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then said I, ah, Lord God, but I cannot speak, for I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go out to whom I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak it. Don't be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Come on, church. God wants to touch your mouth. God wants to anoint your heart. It's not about, well, this is where I'm at in life. It doesn't matter where you are in life. If you'll grab these six principles and say, I want the Spirit of God to come upon me, and I'm going to go cast out devils and heal the sick. (laughs) Daniel was only 16 years old when he was deported to Babylon, about 900 miles away. 16. Did you know Daniel was about 80 years old when he was thrown into the lion's den? Come on, 80-year-olds. I'm just telling you, your age doesn't matter. In the New Testament, Jesus called 12 disciples. He saw him fishing, saw tax collectors, wherever he's, come follow me, come follow me. He gave them the calling, come follow me. He called apostles, he called prophets. He He begins this call, he calls Peter. He calls Paul. He called Peter, Paul, and Mary. (laughs) If you're laughing at that, you're old. (laughs) You think about the word called, it's this, it's kletos. K-L-E-T-O-S, kletos. It's God's invitation. Can I just tell you, church, God's giving you an invitation Come on into this ministry. Come on into this calling. Come on and fulfill this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Come fulfill calling. And what we're bad about is sending God to voicemail. Yeah, you know what it's like when you get a phone call on your text message and you're in something and you can't really take the call and you just hit that little button and send them to voicemail? And God said, man, don't send me to voicemail. There's a person across the counter there that needs your love, that needs his love. Don't send me to voicemail. I'm, I'm going to let you pass by somebody right now, and you need, to, you need to hear my calling. You need to stop, and you need to ask that person, can I pray with you today? We're bad about sending God to voicemail because we're busy, we don't have time, and I'm just telling you, the only reason he's calling you is because there's a, there's a desperate moment that needs to happen, and it's for them, and it's for you. As a pastor, I I try to make sure everybody has my cell phone, and if you don't, I'm willing to give you my cell phone. I want you to know, most of the time, people only call me when there's really good news or really bad news. I'm just saying. When God calls you and taps on your heart, when he comes to you in the middle of the night and he wakes you up and you don't know why you're up, open that word and say, God, speak to me. Speak to me. Because when God speaks to you, there's a circumstance that you're about to go through or somebody's about to go through. And when you step up and you're that voice, when you become Jesus with skin on, you become, the, you become a person that operates in the calling of the Lord Most High. Remember this. God initiates the call. We respond. And as we respond, we discover the purpose. Most of us want the purpose before we respond. 
And I'm just telling you, all through Scripture, when God called Abram, he said, Abram, I want you to leave this land, leave your family, leave what you're familiar with, and I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. He responded, and as he went, he discovered he was going to be the father of many nations. All through the Scripture, Moses, you can just go right on. God calls, we respond, and as we respond, we discover purpose. John 15 and verse 16. Remember this. You didn't choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. It's calling. The CEV version is a contemporary English version. I've never read it, but as I was looking through translations and reading this, here's what it says. You didn't choose me, I chose you, and I sent you out to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that will last. That's calling. That's calling. Miss Gail, if you could come to the keyboard. There's a well, well-known Bible verse that I'm praying over each one of us in this series. When I ask you to make this personal for yourself, this is the scripture that I'm praying over you. It's Ephesians 1, verse 17 through 19. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? This is the the verse. Get the scales off your eyes. Stop living in your own self world. It isn't about you. If you'll step into your calling, you're going to bring light of Christ to so many people. Every week, you should be so excited to get to the house of the Lord to share with somebody what God did. There ought to be something going on in, that, in your world causing you to have a power, that, that rejoicing in your spirit. Amen. Would you stand up on your feet with me, please? Last Sunday when we uh, closed the service, the altar call was filled with people that came to know Jesus Christ. It was probably the highlight for me of the whole service. And I was really encouraged. And I'm going to ask again that every person in this room would see yourself as an evangelist right now. That you would take opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. If you'd bow your hearts right now, and just I want you just to pray, God, give me the right smile. Give me the right words. Use me right now to fulfill calling. Lord, if there's a person beside me, behind me, that needs your love. I pray that you would give me the right words that would encourage them to come to the altar and kneel with me. Everybody slip your hands up to the Lord. Everybody in the house, could you just do this with me? Just slip your hands to the Lord. And just say to God, I surrender to your will. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name. Right now, I believe there are people in this room that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe there are a lot of people in this room that are backslidden. This has been a hard week for you, and you got here to the house of the Lord, and now the Spirit of the Lord is going to draw you to this altar, and you and Jesus are going to have a little talk. And he's going to come, and he's going to bring healing and wholeness to your heart. The Bible says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Christ has risen from the dead, you shall be saved. I'm asking everybody to be Jesus with skin on right now, and with compassion, look to somebody and say, hey, do you want to go to the altar? I'll go with you, and then bring them and find a place to pray. Right now, everybody just turn and minister to somebody around you.